Thank you. Uh, Dean Elenikoff has asked me to do the introduction because he's stuck on a plane coming back from Israel. And so uh, I have the honor of opening the Georgetown Center on Law and National Security. And this is, of course, our kickoff event. And it wouldn't have been possible without the really serious, dedicated help of our two fellows, Justin Florence and Matthew Gerke. Um, Matthew spent several years working at DOD on, de on detention issues. Issues, and Justin uh, has just recently finished clerking for Judge Motz on the Fourth Circuit. Now, why are we doing the center? Why is Georgetown adding yet another center to its ever-growing list? Well, I and many of my colleagues here at Georgetown see the war on terror as the next great legal challenge. In some ways, it's even like the challenge faced by the civil rights era in Brown versus Board of Education. Certainly not as far-reaching in some of its aspects, but at least as intricate a set of concerns. Uh, and in some ways, it's even harder than, say, Brown or the civil rights era, because there, there was at least a social consensus uh, among elites that the right thing should be done, and we knew what that right thing was. Here, that's a lot harder. And of course, here we have an ever changing technological set of facts, the rise of asymmetrical warfare, modern transportation, things that make the factual matrices change very rapidly. And at least with Brown, of course, the courts were much better suited to dealing with this set of problems. Uh, when we're dealing with terrorism, foreign policy, and all the host of questions, the role of the law, the role of the courts is very, very different. And so our, the goal of our center is to think through these issues and not do it in a kind of standard, the democratic approach or the Republican approach, or even the former government official or the NGO approach, but to bring all of these different groups together to th and all the and individuals with experience in, from all these different perspectives to think through what should the answers look like, what are the hard questions. And I'd like to mention just briefly some of the people who are affiliated with the center so you can get a sense of the rich that uh, our faculty uh, and staff bring to this endeavor. Uh, Professor Rosa Brooks, a former senior advisor at the Department of State, a Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor, and a columnist for the Los Angeles Times. Professor David Cole, who's litigated many of the key civil liberties questions in the war on terror, including challenges to the Patriot Act and material support laws, the legal affairs correspondent for The Nation magazine, and the author of two books that are relevant to this subject, Enemy Aliens, Double Standards, and Constitutional Freedoms in the War on Terrorism, and a second book called Terrorism in the Constitution, Sacrificing Civil Liberties for National Security. Another uh, uh, faculty member, Professor Viet Dinh, the man who authored much of the Patriot Act that Professor Cole litigates against. And uh, Professor Din served as the head of the DOJ Office of Legal Policy. Professor David Coplow, a former special assistant for the U.S. Uh, Depart Director on Arms Control and Disarmament, and also the former Deputy General Counsel of International Affairs at the Department of Defense. Professor Marty Lederman, who I'm very, very pleased to say has just uh, announced that he's going to join our faculty on a full-time basis, and a former lawyer at the Justice Department Office of Legal Counsel, and perhaps the nation's preeminent blogger on questions of national security and civil liberties. Professor David Luban, a distinguished philosopher and student of international criminal law and the laws of war. David is recently writing about many of the ethical issues that lawyers face in the war on terror. Professor Nick Rosencrantz, a former Office of Legal Counsel, attorney advisor. Professor Rosencrantz has written deeply on the issues about treaties and how they alter our constitutional order. Professor Jane Stromseth, a former National Security Director and attorney advisor at the Office of Legal Advisor, Department of State, and the co-author of Can Might Make Rights, Building the Rule of Law After Military Interventions, and a book called The Origins of Flexible Response, The Debate Over NATO. And I'll just do one more, but I could do this for quite a while. Professor Carlos Vasquez, who served as the United States member of the Inter-American Juridical Committee from 2001 to 2003, and perhaps the nation's leading scholar of the ways in which treaties alter domestic law. That's just some of the folks, and I think you can see from the breadth of experience what kind of talent we have and what we are planning to do, which is to literally change the world by thinking through these issues on a serious basis. And so with that in mind, our very first event is 
one that I think demonstrates the spirit of what we are all about here at Georgetown. And I thought when I, about, when I was thinking about introducing these two, it occurred to me that I'd just tell you why, I, why they were my first two picks and why I'm so delighted that they are here to, to speak with you. I, I think it's quite honestly rare to have heroes in the law anymore. Everyone makes mistakes. And everyone knows tough decisions have to be made. And when these two faced tough decisions, they both stood up for principle, security and liberty. I know none of this was easy for them, but it had to be done, and they did it well. I think they both embody what is best about the law, carefulness, integrity, balance, and hard work. Jamie Gorelick was a former deputy attorney general under President Clinton, a commissioner on the 9-11 Commission, and is now a partner at Wilmer Hale in Washington, D.C., Jack Goldsmith was the head of the Office of Legal Counsel under President Bush for a short while and is now the Shattuck Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. Now both of them face some constraints in what they can and can't talk about because of ongoing representations or because of past representations and work done on behalf of the government. So I may ask questions to them that are going to veer into those areas and they will shut me down and you'll all understand. So my first question will be for you, uh, Jamie. Um, in April 2004, you wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post called The Truth About the Wall. And in your op-ed, you mentioned how uh, a week earlier, Attorney General at the time, John Ashcroft, stated that the single greatest structural cause for September 11th was the wall that segregated criminal investigations and intelligence agents. And he also said that you happened to have built it. Um, what is this wall? Um, and what was the relationship between the wall and uh, the uh, events that happened on September 11th. And can you talk generally as a Justice Department official about how you went about as a matter of process deciding what legal rules should apply on things like the wall? Well, in, um, in 1978, after the uh, Church Committee had found many different problems with the way in which our intelligence community and our law enforcement community had been uh, wiretapping citizens, Congress passed the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which, frankly, until 9-11 uh, really uh, was a sort of backwater statute, which was implemented uh, by the Justice Department and the intelligence community. Uh, as the law developed, um, the courts, the, the lower courts basically held that uh, if you w wanted to ha get a wiretap uh, uh, in the national security area, you needed to uh, show the special court that was set up to issue these warrants um, that the purpose, the primary purpose of, of obtaining the warrant was uh, to achieve a national security uh, end and not for law enforcement because there was this worry on the part of Congress and on the part of the courts that people would do an end run and they would use this other uh, mechanism to get uh, a wiretap uh, that they could have, uh, that they would have had to use normal Title III procedures uh, otherwise to get. Um, after the Aldra James case, Aldra James, uh, most of you will remember, was a noted spy. Uh, he uh, he uh, was apprehended, and most of the evidence against him was um, uh, was uh, under was gotten under under FISA. Um, there started to become uh, heightened questions about the processes by which. The, uh, the various parts of the government were interacting with each other. And so the Attorney General, uh, uh, Attorney General Reno, asked her head of the Office of Intelligence Policy Review to look at this and set out some procedures. And the procedures uh, he proposed were to in interpose his office between the FBI and prosecutors so that uh, there could be no uh, tainting, if you will, of these FISA wiretaps. The, Criminal Division and the FBI uh, went nuts over this and basically didn't like it at all. And so the Attorney General asked that uh, we convene a group of people to look at this. So you had, so here you had a, a statute which basically laid out the conditions. You had courts that said the primary purpose of a FISA wiretap had to be uh, a national security and not, uh, not law enforcement. And you had the courts that looked at the involvement of a prosecutor as uh, almost per se uh, showing that the purpose was criminal rather than national security. 
So we had this um, uh, in the uh, Executive Office of National Security. They convened a group, and they came up with a consensus recommendation to uh, put in place some, essentially some procedures that limited communications between the uh, FBI national security agents and criminal prosecutors. That's all that the, that the, that the procedures did. Um, what happened was, a after this was, was put in place, uh, what happened was that people started to move further and further away from the line. And so what, uh, it, it, it began to be a very encumbered process. By about 1997, 1998, uh, questions started to be raised about this. I had left in early 97, so I wasn't there for much of this, but it's all detailed in numerous reports that were done. The bottom line is that, uh, um, you know, what I was part of was part of a continuum that was based on a statute judicial interpretations, and particularly the FISA court saying we are not going to have a situation in which anyone could possibly argue that the criminal process was, uh, was driving the use of FISAs. Um, you know, for reasons of his own, John Ashcroft decided to lay this entire history on me and, uh, and you know, I think really to avoid the kind of uh, criticism that he was going to be facing in the 9-11 Commission uh, hearing. Uh, it is a, it's not a simple story, but it is a story of one uh, uh, government trying to deal with a, a set of concerns and the bureaucracies becoming afraid of, of, of addressing the conflict and therefore moving, uh, moving away from it. In the end, uh, after the uh, Patriot Act was passed, it, it changed that primary purpose test. And even with that, the FISA court kept the rules in place that we had put in place. Those rules had been ratified and reissued by John Ashcroft's own deputy. So if, if I could have eliminated the wall with a flick of my pen, so could he. Uh, the court st stayed with it until uh, long thereafter uh, being overruled by the special uh, FISA Court of Appeals. And even after the legal wall came down, the cultural divide remained. Excellent. And let me um, ask one other question about that, because it seems to me there's two aspects of this question about the wall. One is, of course, what actually happened? What, what did you do? The other is, uh, you know, how this story came to be told. Um, you know, you had mentioned that now it's been documented in a series of episodes. Now, those episodes were based on classified information that was declassified on the eve of the Attorney General's hearing, right? right. Uh, yeah. or, or close to, right before he was about to testify. Um, what was the rationale for declassifying something uh, like that, uh, you know, which was purely historic, a historical event ten years before? Well, I mean, he was just trying to get me. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was really obvious. He also took a uh, he took a memo that I I had written. The the policy was the, that that um, that I was just describing was issued by my boss, Janet Reno, but he took a memo that I had written, which was actually designed to help um, uh, the uh, FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office in New York to handle a very particular situation, uh, and declassified it and asserted that it was the, that I, that I essentially wrote the later policy, um, which it had nothing to do with. The, so it, he, he, it was a dishonest piece of work. And uh, it was designed, I think, to derail the conversation that the 9-11 Commission was going to have with him about his failures in the course of his tenure. And are either of you familiar with any example, because I'm very interested in this question of classification and declassification authority, and many people, as we'll talk about in a, in a few minutes, believe that too much information has been classified. But this is a scenario in which that something is being declassified. Uh, and uh, are you familiar with any example in which we've had a declassification done for purposes of kind of a retrospective look back at, uh, you know, what a commissioner or what a government official Well, the irony, done? well, I mean, uh, the irony here was that w the 9-11 Commission, of course, was seeking 
uh, these very documents and not receiving them or uh, not receiving them in a declassified fashion that we could use. We did, um, and Dan Marcus, the general counsel of the commission, is here in the audience. We spent a, an enormous amount of our time and effort on the 9-11 commission trying to get uh, retrospective, uh, a ret a, a, um, declassification so that people could see mm -hmm. uh, why um, why the government had done what it had done in various instances. So for historical purposes, it made a lot of sense as a, you know, as an effort to uh, pillory or mislead an individual person. It, it mm -hmm. you know, it's clearly an abuse. Thank you. Uh, Jack, here is a passage from your really interesting new book. Uh, here's a passage. Many people think the Bush administration has been indifferent to wartime legal constraints. But the opposite is true. The administration has been strangled by law, and since September 11th, this war has been lawyered to death. The administration has paid attention to law, not necessarily because it wanted to, but rather because it had no choice. Now, some people read this quote to say the administration acted with fidelity to law. Others say it only paid attention to law so it could find the loopholes within the law. Uh, a lot of people are confused by this passage and indeed this aspect of your book. Uh, it would be great if you would just talk about what exactly you meant. Sure. I obviously don't think, um, here, here's what I meant. I meant that um, I think it's clearly the case that law encumbers and applies to and governs the commander in chief in this war in ways that have never been the case before. Um, and so I think there's more law touching on more aspects of presidential power. That's, that's the first point. I think that's not terribly controversial. Um, and um, when I, this, in this passage, I wasn't necessarily referring to people at the very top of the administration, but people throughout the executive branch who, in every aspect of their actions in, in the uh, war on terrorism, have been bumping up against laws, some of them which are either out of date or have an uncertain application or aren't either clear, aren't clear on their face or aren't clear in application to a novel war. So there have been tons of legal uncertainty. Um, the Department of Justice, whatever you think of its legal analysis, it has written, I, this is a guess, but I'm pretty sure it's true, it's written many more legal opinions in this war related to presidential power and compliance with the law than um, probably every, every Justice Department in their, uh, since the beginning of the Justice Department 100 and some odd years ago combined. So the point of the passage was to say that um, while well, it's obvious that the Bush administration hasn't always um, given the best reading to the law in some of its opinions, that's not what the point was addressed to. The point was addressed to the idea that the executive is just indifferent to law. It, it wasn't able to be indifferent to law. It couldn't be indifferent to law because there was so much of it, because it was enforced by criminal sanctions, because the members in the executive branch who were required to act in the aggressive way to stop the terror threat were um, chilled from doing so because of all these legal uncertainties, and um, that's that's basically what I meant. So, so Jack, when you say that there, it's not controversial that there's more law touching on the commander in chief function uh, now than at times in the past. I guess you're right. That's not controversial. I, the question is, is there more binding law? on the commander in chief and you say well the administration paid attention to uh, law but at least some people believe they at least until you got there let's, we'll talk the pre Goldsmith era uh, a lot of people believe that the administration paid attention to law for simply one reason to find out what the, how they can dismiss it by say the commander in chief clause override or whatever so yeah, I guess I don't think I don't think that's an accurate characterization I mean I think the I mean that's a, that's a convenient characterization that these people were motivated to get rid of the law because they hated the law and wanted to act in a lawless fashion, but I don't think that's a I, fair I characterization. Just, just, I don't quite think that's the criticism. I don't think people are saying they hate the law, but I'm sure they, the people motivated at the Office of Legal Counsel, uh, the critics would say, were motivated by good reasons, national security. But nevertheless, when push came to shove, they said whenever there was a statutory constraint, the prohibition on torture or the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act prohibiting electronic surveillance, they'd say, well, the Constitution trumps whatever the statute says. Is that incorrect? Or? First of all, let's be clear. I mean, the, the passage was meant to uh, describe the executive branch, not the Office of Legal Counsel. And I was trying to get at the idea that 
law permeates the executive branch. And uh, Michael Scheuer said in testimony last spring, you can't go to the bathroom of the CIA without getting the approval of a lawyer. And that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but it's not a whole lot of an exaggeration. Uh, the executive branch is highly legalized, and lawyers have an important role in just about every decision because there's so much law touching on every decision and so much criminal law. So that's the comment was directed to the executive branch generally. Okay. Now, the, the Office of Legal Counsel opinions are the ones I can talk about. Um, look, I don't think a lot of the opinions, obviously, that I um, withdrew. So, you know, I th and for reasons that I stated in my book, I thought that their analysis was faulty. And I thought uh, that um, they made a lot of extremely unnecessary and overbroad claims about uh, executive power. And I thought that the analysis was far, far, far broader than was needed to address the issues that were ongoing in the underlying programs. And so that I believe that. But, but ask me the question again in light of that. Sorry. Well, the, the question is uh, uh, more broadly than, of course, the passage in your book. But uh, has, the, has this, uh, you know, whether it's the Office of Legal Counsel or the administration more generally, have they ever said no, given all those legal, before you got there, given all the legal constraints, you're saying they pay attention to the law, uh, you can't go to the bathroom and, and so on without getting the permission of a lawyer. Um, but I think all of us are familiar with some things that the CIA has done with respect to the destruction of tapes and other things in which it seems like they had, maybe they paid attention to the law, but maybe perhaps only for the purpose of breaking it. No, I don't think that's accurate at all. I think that Again, the vast majority of executive branch officials in the vast majority of times paid attention to the law because they wanted to comply with the law and because they, both because they thought it was the right thing to do and because they feared the sanctions of breaking the law. Um, now, again, I think that there are some people in the administration that gave wildly inaccurate interpretations of the law. Um, I don't. Others can question their motives. I think they acted in good faith based on their beliefs and, you know, the executive power and the like. I do believe, as I said in my book, that a lot of the um, unnecessarily overbroad uh, aspects of these opinions and a lot of the most unfortunate language in these opinions was driven by a conception of executive power that um, I think was just wrong. But I'll also say that, again, if we're talking motivations, I think they were grounded in a principled, though erroneous, view of executive power. So I don't think that, um, um, I just don't think it's that your description is accurate. Okay, I, again, to be clear, I am not questioning anyone's motives, and I, I think many of the critics aren't. I, I understand this debate does get but, yeah, we, really you, polarized, but let's just... No, no, I'm not trying to keep it polarized. You said they acted for a reason, and I thought that had to do with motivations. I don't well, think that they the acted reasons, to break the law. Right. The reasons were motivated by national security and the good of the country, and you say that they pay attention to law, but I guess the question is what conception of what was their conception of law? And if you take the conception of law that is embodied in the memos that have been declassified, like the memo last week on torture, which says, as I understand it, that the commander in chief clause will override a statute passed by Congress, then how is it even possible for the executive branch to break the law anymore? Again, um I'm not sure what we're disagreeing about. Um, first of all, it's not controversial in the, that in some instances Congress does things that are unlawful because they exceed, they impinge upon an exclusive uh, commander-in-chief power. So the general proposition by itself is not um, un, is not remarkable. How it was applied in those opinions, I think, was deeply erroneous. I agree with that. Um, I guess the proposition that we started out with about paying attention to law, I don't think that the most egregious memoranda that have leaked and that have all these uh, admittedly outlandish claims on behalf of executive power, I don't think they're representative of the executive branch. And frankly, I don't even think... Um, um, you know, I said in the book that I thought so much of the analysis in in the interrogation opinions was unnecessary. Uh, I don't even think they that they they represent what was necessary in those cases. Um, so again, I do think people paid attention to law. I think that they did not do things because the law prohibited it. But listen, I don't want to deny that uh, people at the top of the administration 
top lawyers in the administration uh, in the early years had an unusually, unbelievably large conception of executive power. And that conception of executive power was one that, as those opinions suggest, was one that uh, in which they believed that Congress couldn't regulate much of the commander in chief's authority on the battlefield, and um, so again, I can't. I'm not going to defend those uh, claims because I thought they were wrong at the time. But again, I think it's an and I and I understand why people might think that these opinions represent. Um, everything that they did underlying uh, under that we don't know about. I don't think that's true. Um, I don't even think that a lot of this extreme language was necessary in these opinions. So again, I'm not sure what we're disagreeing about, but I don't think it's fair even for people with the broadest conception of executive power to say that they uh, only cared about the law so that they could, I think you said, that they could get around it. That's just not what motivated them. I don't think that's what motivated them at all, if we're talking about the reasons why they acted the way they did. Let me bring Jamie in on this question. Jack says that it's not controversial that uh, uh, that if a statute impinges on the commander-in-chief clause, in some instances, the uh, that one can say that uh, that statute should be disregarded. Did you ever face this question at the Justice Department, a statute that you believed restricted presidential powers? Uh, and how did you deal with that as a matter of process? And in looking forward, how do you think the next administration should deal with those questions? Well, without <clears throat> discussing particular uh, opinions and instances um, that we faced, I would say this, and I think it's consistent with the thinking that permeates Jack's book as well. Um, when you get into a situation in which the executive's view of its power conflicts with Congress's view of its power, a conversation would be helpful. And what we didn't have and why people are questioning the actual motivation of the individuals to whom Jack refers is that you had on the one hand this ex extremely broad assertion of executive authority, one that, um, taken to its logical and illogical extreme, would eviscerate all other sources of constitutional power in, in our um, otherwise finely tuned system of checks and balances, and would do so secretly so that the rest of the government thought it was having a say on some of the most important issues of our time, particularly those at the intersection of liberty and security. So it's not crazy that people have come to the conclusion that what was motivating individuals to press for opinions of the breadth that came out of the Office of Legal Counsel and the Justice Department at the time was a desire to have the, the effect that actually resulted, which was the evisceration of congressional authority and the potential evisceration of judicial authority. Let me ask you both this. Um, you know, it, in, uh, it's, uh, it's January 20th, 2009, and the new president, and I could believe, I believe this could happen. A President McCain asks you, Jamie, for advice on how the Justice Department should retool things in the war on terror, or President Obama asks you, Jack. Um, and here are some of the things that they're worried about. They're worried about the kind of quick resort to the commander-in-chief clause as an override. They're worried about consultation with Congress. But they're also worried about the fact, who's going to go serve as the head of Office of Legal Counsel right now, where the Deputy Attorney General and have to sign off on what are undoubtedly going to be tough opinions to sign off on um, because uh, the war on terror is going to demand some tough things. How, uh, what are some of the ways that we should, as a matter of process, be thinking about uh, 2009? Well, let me make two comments. Um, the first is that um, there is an extraordinary level of consensus among shall we say, old hands, people who have actually served in the Office of Legal Counsel, on the scope of executive authority, uh, the substance of 
uh, the law on um, intelligence gathering, on interrogation, on commissions, on the Patriot Act. And so um, the first thing that I would do is to try to return to that consensus. There are differences, whether they're in the 10 percent or 20 percent area, I don't know. Um, but there is a large consensus which has been obliterated from public view by the highly politicized nature of the debate. When um, President Bush and Attorney General Ashcroft say that the Patriot Act is necessary because we need to reject everything that was done before and come out with a completely new legal construct in order to keep us safe, the Democrats naturally react by saying, if we're completely redoing the construct, that is bad and scary and uh, inappropriate. Well, when you actually look at the Patriot Act uh, in a calm fashion, much of it was, um, and might even say most of it, was uh, re, uh, reheated uh, proposals that you know, I testified in favor of. Um, there were pieces of it that went too far, and they have basically been fixed. This big brouhaha went out with a whimper in the end. And so I would uh, try to figure out a way to bring together the kinds of people that you actually, in fact, convene uh, here in this room fairly regularly to to uh, reach a bipartisan consensus to the extent, uh, to the extent uh, uh, possible. Second, um, I would, uh, returning to the point I made earlier, try to air some of these differences and debate both the efficacy of the programs and the legal opinions that are being reached. Not to say that you would take away from the Office of Legal Counsel and the Justice Department the authority ultimately to, to opine, but I do think um, some discussion would further narrow differences. I am very worried that, um, you know, the lawsuit against John Yu, filed by folks at Yale, for example, it would be a tremendous disincentive mm -hmm. for a head of the Office of Legal Policy to make decisions in often in short order. I mean, my partner, Randy Moss, when he was the head of the Office of Legal Counsel, had to make a decision on a potentially life or death matter in five minutes. You know, if you think you're going to be sued either way, that would weigh on you. So I'm quite worried about where we are. Um, so I, I agree with everything Jamie said, and I want to emphasize the first point that she said, and that was, I think you were talking about matters of substance. I agree that actually on matters of substance about how to deal with the medium-term terror threat, I think we're actually closer to a f more or less final consensus than many people realize. I think we've come a long way since the early years after 2001, 2002. Congress has been involved a lot in the last several years. And so I don't actually think that there's a huge, giant differences that needed to be um, um, bridged. On the process question that Neil asked about, um, I do think that a wise president, whomever the next president is, would take steps to ensure that, if we're talking just about the Office of Legal Counsel, that the Office of Legal Counsel um, adheres to and respects the traditional practices that it that it followed, procedural practices that it followed in both administrations before 9-11 and that I believe broke down to a significant degree after 9-11 and that I believe are and, and partly responsible for some of the um, unfortunate legal opinions. Can you flesh those Sure, out? sure. And, and a lot of these principles are, uh, I don't agree with every jot and tittle, but there's an excellent um, um, former OLC attorneys um, um, in 2002 or 2003 wrote at this... 2004. There it is. There principles it is. to guide the Office of Legal Counsel, December 21st, 2004. I agree with just about all of these principles, and I think they're an excellent uh, basis for what the next president should insist that OLC do. And they're basically process issues like 
um, writing opinions that only address the issue before you rather than abstract um, excursions about what the law might mean or what the law means in the abstract not apply to particular cases. Ensuring before you give uh, a piece of advice to an agency that the agency itself put its views in writing both so that uh, the agency is not just sloughing off responsibility onto the Justice Department to make hard legal decisions and to ensure that OLC has the fully informed views of that agency. Um, a really important procedural point is uh, deliberation uh, both within OLC, that process broke down, within the Justice Department, within the executive branch ensuring that all interested agencies have a full chop on the issue so that OLC is a, really a generalist office. It's a very small office of 22 lawyers and we, we really rely on the expertise of the agencies um, throughout the government to bring to bear on the opinions to make sure we're not committing egregious errors. That process broke down. And then finally I think um, deliberation with Congress. I think that there should be a strong presumption, stronger than any OLC has had as far as I'm concerned, in favor of publishing OLC opinions. Um, and you know there are going to be limitations on that. There are going to be um, there are all sorts of arguments the executive can make, legal arguments about why it doesn't have to publish. And I think those legal arguments are probably sound. But I think a wise executive would have a policy of publishing opinions. I think that policy would um, both inform the Congress and the public about what the executive is doing under law, and I think it would have a. Um, um, a really useful effect on the opinion writers in OLC. Um, because the, the main problem that the Office of Legal Counsel has as an as a institution that tries, that is supposed to try to give as neutral as possible an interpretation of the law, one of the main problems it has institutionally is it doesn't have an adversary process. It has to try to recreate one. There aren't adversarial briefs. There's not a dissenting opinion. Um, there's not appellate review. And all of those institutional checks that we usually rely on in the court system to make sure that big mistakes aren't committed need to be recreated, especially inside the executive branch. Um, now, I don't think um, I don't think we can get around the problem of having an institution inside the Justice Department that's going to interpret the law for the executive branch. I think that's a problem that we can't get around. But I think we can do a lot better in ensuring that those institutions do as good a job as they can. But let me also say, and something, pick up on something Jamie said uh, at the last second. I mean, it's not the case that the best interpretation of the law always cuts against presidential power and in favor of civil liberties, for example. And there are going to be lots of hard calls in any administration that a lawyer is going to have to make, again, as, as Jamie emphasized, with time pressures, limited resources, and there are going to be hard calls, and um, there are going to be times when these processes cannot be fully used. Uh, and they're going to be, and, and I just think that um, we need to give the lawyers acting in good faith in OLC a little bit of space for error, frankly. Um, but I think we should try to minimize error as much as we can by adopting these and related processes. Can I just ask a question, Jack? Um, the opinions um, that you um, ultimately rescinded. Was it your understanding that they had been vetted within the Justice Department beyond the Office of Legal Counsel? Um, yes, within the Justice Department to some degree. I'm not 100 percent sure to what degree, but my sense was that they had been vetted inside the Justice Department to some degree. Because, I mean, I, I always thought that the um, the process by which uh, OLC opinions developed within the Department of Justice was one that um, did in some ways uh, recreate an adversary uh, system right. in that, you know, when Walter Dellinger would come to the table and he would say, I'm working on an opinion that says X, here's my current thinking. You had the Solicitor General there, you had uh, me, the Attorney General, our uh, senior staff, and you got some cacophony there that I thought was really useful. I have heard, initially I understood that the opinions that are so controversial were simply just issued by John Yu by himself. But then um, various people within the White House Counsel's Office told me that that wasn't true and that they assured themselves that the Attorney General uh, personally and sometimes the Deputy as well were signed on, which was surprising to me given the nature of the opinions. Right. I can just say two things. I can't talk about this too much. Um, first, as I said in my book, um, 
it is true that the Attorney General Ashcroft, when he interviewed me for my job, was very, the only issue we talked about for an hour was ensuring him that I, as head of the Office of Legal Counsel, would keep the Attorney General in the loop. Now, if you think about that for a second, it's just a remarkable set of questions, and I couldn't believe that that was what he was asking me because the Office of Legal Counsel exercises power delegated from the Attorney General, really acting in, under his authority, and there was nothing of any significance that I did without fully running things by the Attorney General. I don't know the extent to which he was vetted on various matters before I got there. I do know, however, that he believed um, this would have been in the spring of 2000 three, that it was really important for the next head of OLC to bring, to have much closer consultation with him. The second thing I'll say is that I think one of the most remarkable things about, and I'll just leave it at this, I'm just telling you what's in the document, one of the most remarkable things about the recently released memorandum from uh, John Yu to the Defense Department is the fact that it says that the criminal division um, approved and signed off on some of the controversial decisions under various federal laws. So it seems like it was vetted to at least the criminal division there, and um, I mean, it should have been vetted to the Attorney General. I don't know the extent to which it was. I don't know fully the extent to you which it was. You could imagine if you were in the uh, Defense Department, so putting on my DOD General Counsel hat, uh, you might have wanted the criminal division to sign off. Yeah. If you were telling people uh, what interrogation techniques but just well, But that's that's... Surely you would want that from DOD's perspective, but OLC and everyone should want, whenever I interpreted it a criminal law, I would always give it to the criminal division because they're the experts. They have equities in how the statute will be enforced in context that I don't even fully appreciate. They're experts in criminal law. So it should have been, and it always should go to the criminal division, um, and it seems like in that case it did. So, Jack, uh, you've made uh, two big complaints about some of the Office of Legal Counsel memos. One is the notion of consultation, but the other you have uh, returned to time and again is the idea that the opinions were too broad. Um, why is that a criticism? Uh, is this a matter of just legal craftsmanship and your approach to writing a judicial opinion? I mean, because there's an argument on the other side that says we need these opinions to be brought to give guidance in the field so that people know in rapidly evolving circumstances what they can and can't do. Um, and uh, in, in addition to that, uh, there's a school of thought that says even after you reined in some of those opinions, uh, things didn't change, actually. Yeah, maybe you had a narrower opinion in one instance, but then it just became broader over time. There was a report yesterday by ABC News that after the torture memos were, the so-called torture memos were rescinded uh, and uh, the Dan Levin opinion came into effect, the Principles Committee authorized this very same enhanced interrogation techniques that were authorized under the initial memo. So why should it matter, why isn't it better to have broad opinions if that is ultimately what the legal conclusion is going to be? Um, if it's ultimately what the legal conclusion is going to be. Uh, my, my preference for narrow for this, for opinions that just decide the issue before and the requested agency action is so it's a it's a long-standing OLC principle I think it's a good one because um, when you decide it's for the same reason that judges tend to decide issues um, that, that is generally good advice for judges to decide to decide issues in a concrete factual circumstance rather than just deciding legal issues in the abstract um, first of all, when you go beyond the facts of what you're being asked to approve or not approve, you don't know what the implications are of what you're saying. You might be saying something in the abstract that has implications you can't even understand, and those implications might inform your analysis. Um, and so as a general matter, I think it's prudent to, for those reasons and related reasons, to just decide the issue before you. Those opinions were abstract interpretations of the law without any particular question before them. Just what do these phrases mean? And they gave, I mean, they, they didn't give clear guidance in this, except to the extent that they said that there was no legal constraint. And if that's what you mean by clear guidance, I obviously think that's not the right thing. But deciding abstract questions abstractly, if you do anything short of saying there's no legal hurdle, you can do whatever you want, which is not what the law usually says, um, then an, an abstract analysis wouldn't provide legal guidance, I think, uh, you know, depending on wh what's at issue. So those are basically the reasons I think narrow is better than broad. I quote um, in, you know, um, 
a CIA lawyer in the books talking about Attorney General and former head of OLC, um, William Barr. And he said, you know, Bill Barr was not shy about um, a, a broad interpretations of executive power when necessary and appropriate, but he never, ever authorized anything one centimeter beyond what he was asked to authorize, simply because, again, your legal interpretation might change in a different factual circumstance, and you don't know what the implications of the analysis are beyond the facts before you. Both of you have referred to a kind of emerging consensus among, at least as Jamie put it, old government hands in the war on terror. I want to talk to you about, I want to ask you about one aspect of that, which is the role of international law. So Jack, you recently wrote uh, in Slate magazine the following, work with, as one of your recommendations for fixing uh, the uh, war on terror in the next administration, work with allies to establish an international legal framework for terrorists. Last week, John McCain called for a new international national understanding on the disposition of dangerous detainees. This is a good idea, not because of a squishy commitment to internationalism, but because an international consensus on how to treat detainees would foster deeper international cooperation. To achieve this goal, the U.S. must, ta must stop talking about which international laws do not govern the detention of terrorists and start talking about which ones do. Now, you had written a book earlier, Jack, um, with Eric Posner called The Limits of International Law, in which you essentially claimed international law, and tell me if I'm mischaracterizing this, but was toothless and largely irrelevant that it can't be enforced. You're mischaracterizing uh, the book, yes. Okay. Um, it's, uh, I urge you to read it, Neil. Uh, I have read it. So, um, uh, so the question is... Uh, uh, you know, what is your role for international law? Um, one blogger asked, Jack, Jack, have you gone squishy on the role of international law? Uh, and so... Uh, sure, I mean, uh, my views on international law haven't changed. I mean, those are two entirely different uh, contexts. But, um, look, international law, in my view, helps nations achieve mutually beneficial ends. And if it's done the right way, it can help nations achieve mutually beneficial ends. The book that you're talking about said that was, and this is, I don't think this is very surprising, said that's a lot easier to accomplish in bilateral than in multilateral contexts. But we do have multilateral co cooperation of various sorts. And um, it is obvious that our, um, I think over the last six or seven years, that our failure to articulate governing standards for the detention of um, if governing international standards for the detention of terrorists whom we capture has harmed us in a variety of ways in getting cooperation with our allies um, in any number of ways. And so the point of that, uh, those two paragraphs in the essay last week was to say this is a good thing for the United States to do. It's in its interests. Again, in its material interests in the sense that I think we can do better in the war on terrorism on balance by having a uh, a settled legal framework. And second, to point out the part that you didn't read, that the, there's movement in Europe to agree that the Geneva Conventions and their pristine 1949 form really aren't up to the task of dealing with this very different problem. And I'm not saying this is a consensus in Europe, it certainly isn't, but there's movement in that direction. So I do think that there's room for consensus. And I think it would help us all, I mean, I'm not a, obviously a foreign policy expert, and obviously I think it would help us in that regard, but I'm th thinking about cooperation in the war on terrorism, terrorism intelligence sharing, uh, and the like, I think would be improved if there were a settled legal framework. And, and before getting to Jamie, just, just on the reason I didn't read the second half is that is what I was going to do because we are at Georgetown launching a center, uh, launching a project as part of our center to reform the Geneva Conventions and to think exactly about the question, Jack, that your, that your essay raises, which is, is this 1949 convention a good tool looking forward in the war on terror? Does it make sense since it was written for really nation states? warfare in mind. Sorry, Jamie. No, I, no, I, I uh, here's, here's what I think about this. I think both domestically and internationally, having settled and agreed upon and supported processes ultimately makes us much safer. Even if you give up some element of your asserted unilateral authority as an executive branch vis-a-vis -vis the other branches or as the United States vis-a-vis -vis other countries. And you can see this time and time again. Uh, in, um, I mentioned earlier uh, the aftermath of the Alder James case. 
One of the upshots of that case was that we had been doing black bag jobs. We had been on the signature of the attorney general going into the home of a spy or his car or his office to take things, take evidence on, with no process other than whatever internal process we chose to have. And the courts had not opined on this. We asserted the inherent authority to do it. There was no statute. And the attorney general said, I do not want to be vulnerable to a defense attorney arguing that my authority was unfounded. My assertion of authority was unfounded. And so we sought legislation to extend the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act to physical searches, giving up, hypothetically, our asserted inherent authority and getting a settled regime. The question was over, gone, done. It, it was over. Now, the, the, uh, the Civil Liberties Union said this was an outrage for Congress to approve black bag jobs. My response was, would you rather just have me do it? Mm -hmm. Or would you rather have a regime with a court and checks and balances? Same thing with FISA. One of the reasons we wanted to have a written process was because we were afraid that the FISA court, which you know doesn't hear an adversarial presentation on whether there should be uh, a, a foreign intelligence uh, uh, warrant, uh, would go along with um, the, uh, giving us the tool that we needed, go, would go along with a warrant if we didn't have processes that showed that we respected what they were saying, which is we don't want prosecutors to be using this as an end run. And the same thing is true in the international environment. If we have a clear mutual international understanding of what the Geneva Conventions require with regard to interrogation, with regard to detention, with regard to the treatment of detainees generally. While we may give up a hypothetical assertion of authority, we gain practical security for our troops, which is why you hear this loud cry coming from our military lawyers about the current state of affairs, because they are the ones who are in jeopardy in the current regime or lack of one. May I just say something in agreement? I, I think just to generalize that this is one of the sort of great mistakes of the Bush administration is that they had a conception of presidential power as the absence of constraint. And they didn't appreciate, and I couldn't, couldn't agree with you more, Jamie, that the president would actually be strengthened in so many of the things he wanted to do by um, working with other institutions of government, even if those, or with allies, even if those, that collaboration um, put legal constraints on the president, there were countervailing benefits and the president would have been in, a, in so many of these fronts in a much better position to have those countervailing benefits. So I, I really agree with that. Thank you. Um, and we have time for a couple of audience questions. So if anyone would like to ask something, there is a microphone somewhere, I believe. Uh, but uh, uh, if uh, not, you can just stand up and ask your question and I'll repeat it. Any questions? Any questions? Bob Litt doesn't have a question. Okay. Um, let me ask you uh, about, uh, both of you, about one of the issues facing Congress at this very moment, which is the issue of retroactive immunity for the telecommunications companies uh, that were uh, alleged to have participated in the NSA surveillance program. Um, Jamie, I'm sure that when you were at the Justice Department, you asked, and maybe even at the, when you were at the Defense Department, you asked private industry for help on any number of things. The argument is, if we don't give this retroactive immunity, then these companies are going to be afraid to cooperate in the future. How would you advise members of Congress to deal with this specific problem? Well, we are, as a matter of public record, representing Verizon in the yeah. lawsuits. But I, 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 this is something that really concerns me. Um, when um, w our government relies upon the private sector in thousands of ways every day. And right now what is happening is uh, I and my colleagues sit in our offices and we field phone calls from individuals in the private sector, companies in the private sector, who are asked to do things and they are told that it is legal 
Um, they are often told that the head of the Office of Legal Counsel has opined. They are told that the Attorney General has opined, and they say, I'll get back to you, Mr. Attorney General, after I talk to Jamie and Randy and her colleagues, and that'll take a couple of weeks. This is not a safe situation. What you want as the Attorney General, when you call uh, someone to ask them to do something that you think is legal in your considered judgment and that the President thinks is necessary, is for that person to say, yes, I would be happy to help in the interest of protecting uh, our people. And what has happened here is that the gold standard of an Office of Legal Opinion opinion is not gold any longer. And I think that the primary challenge to the current Attorney General is to review whatever is left in those Augean stables after Goldsmith left to make sure that when a new Attorney General comes in, uh, uh, he or she can say with tremendous confidence that the, the, that uh, when we say something is lawful, it is lawful. This is we are at our peril here if we do not have a, a, a situation in which we can be confident that the opinions of uh, of our Justice Department um, are what they have historically been, which is an, a a well thought out, well regarded understanding that conduct uh, in, uh, following those, that, that, those opinions uh, is lawful. I, I agree with all that. Nothing to add other than, I actually have nothing to add to that. Well, you don't want to say something about the OG and stables? No. <laughs> I'd actually really rather not. <laughs> but, but Jack, you did go further in your slight piece last week because you said that you think legislation should give retroactive yeah. immunity. Well, I, I, I thought that was entailed in what Jamie said, but if she doesn't, didn't, didn't say that, I do think they should for the reasons Jamie stated. And uh, why do you need that in order to deal with private industry's uh, fear? Uh, that is, I would think that if you give them the uh, shield going forward and say any yeah. cooperation you make from now on, uh, will work, uh, will, will, you'll be insulated from legal reprisal. Why isn't that enough to provide the incentives that Jamie is Well, for two reasons. There are two reasons why I don't think that's enough. One reason is I think it's unfair, just in the abstract, to hold them to lawsuits when they acted in good faith in reliance on a, a Department of Justice representation. Um, and, for, and that's the first point. The second point is uh, I don't think that these uh, – the carriers, there are all sorts of discretionary points at the margin where they have to decide, are we going to act immediately, even with a firm guarantee, or are we going to have to, is this a good faith relationship? Can we trust the government that in helping them here in this important national security area, we're not going to get in trouble later? And I think that the, my sense is that the carriers will, you know, as Jamie just suggested, um, I think even with immunity going forward, I don't think that they're going to be happy with that relationship. And I think we want them, when they're acting in good faith, when there's no suggestion that they acted in bad faith, I think we want them cooperating with the government. And I think that um, I think the main reason that the Congress hasn't given them, I mean, the Senate Intelligence Committee voted 13 to 2 in favor of this, um, uh, of giving um, full immunity, I believe. And um, one reason why I think it, that immunity hasn't happened is because the Congress has, in the, within their rights, been using it as a tool to get information from the executive branch, and that's a perfectly fair political thing for them to do. But I think now is the time, I mean, I think they've gotten a lot from the executive branch, and I think it's really uh, dangerous for our national security not to have the full um, trusting cooperation of, of private industry. Two, two comments. Number one. Um, this problem was largely caused by the failure of the, of the executive branch to consult with Congress um, in the first in instance about what it was doing in its surveillance program. And then um, uh, even when it became quite apparent that uh, it needed something uh, from Congress and in, in that it was asking for immunity for these, for these companies, it it refused to share in a way that I think would have been sensible the underlying information about what the program entailed. I mean, after all, you're asking Congress to do something extraordinary. It didn't ha doesn't have to do. And, and you're telling them, no, but I'm not going to tell you what I've been doing or why I've been doing it or how I've been doing it or why I thought it was legal or anything 
about that. Now, they gradually have been sharing information, but this is just of a piece with what, with what uh, um, uh, Jack was describing. My concern goes well beyond the carriers. When I say we're fielding questions, it's from mm -hmm. every manner of infrastructure uh, uh, capability that is in private hands, and a lot of um, private actors who are currently being hired by the uh, by the U.S. government to perform functions which are um, increasingly uh, similar to what the government itself does in circumstances with immunity for its employees. And, and so it's the, this is more the message that is being sent broadly about whether you have a, have a trusting relationship with your government, which is why it is so important that we return to the kind of principles and procedures that Jack was referring to when he talked about the principles that guide the Office of Legal Counsel that were published in 2004, because without that, um, you don't you don't have that gold standard, and without the gold standard, you have an inherently unsafe situation. Well, thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Let me say that the emerging consensus is that we want you both back in government as fast as possible. So thank you so much for participating. Thank you. Thank you.